Yeah, let's get into it. All right. All right. So we've got former Georgia Bulldog and Cleveland Browns wide receiver Muhammad Masakwai. Uh, before we talk about the upcoming football season, I want to go on and talk about you for a little bit. Is that all right? Yeah, let's get into it. All right. So let, let's just start off with the ATV accident and the prosthetic. Now, trying not to be disrespectful, this thing looks awesome. Like it's if if anybody wants to know more about it, there's a Players Tribune video where you explain what happened with the accident. But I I want to know more about the prosthetic. Like you lost four fingers, and this uh, this robotic yeah. thing allows you it, it. Your hand is fully functional, right? So just first, just thank God for technology. Uh, not knowing what was out there, you never want to lose anybody part, but. And being able to have the device that I have currently, it makes it a lot easier when you have something that looks the way that it does and it functions it the way it does. And it's just uh, amazing where technology has, has come thus far. So is it like it, it's all – I mean, you, you control it with, uh, with like your mind, right? Like, I, so, I don't know how this stuff works. <laughs> so everybody's like, man, is it Iron Man? Is it uh, Luke Skywalker? <laughs> like, is it – mentally control how it works is that there's sensors inside of it okay and your muscles fire off electricity not to get too scientific whenever you're moving them and what they do is they attach sensors to those places that have electricity going through them and then whenever you make a gesture your hand opens and closes so my particular device is from a company called touch bionics and what they've done is just really just enable people like me just to get a lot of their function back um, I have four moving fingers that, that, that move individually. Uh, it's all carbon fiber, so that uh, from an eye eye test, it definitely passes that. So you get stopped a lot by kids and random people in the yeah. airport wanting to see it. Or, or I, I can only by. imagine. T- touch bionics. That in and of itself sounds like something out of like an Iron Man movie. Um, but like, if you oh, wanted yeah, to, if you wanted to flip somebody yeah. off, you could do that, right? Like you'd have no problem. I, I could. You probably wouldn't stand on camera just so it doesn't go viral, but uh, I, I've done it a time or two before. <laughs> I could imagine. I, all right, so uh, so we've got all of that. Let's. Uh, hey, Chris, you want to jump in with uh, with some NFL stuff and whatnot? Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll get talking about a few things. We're gonna we want to hear some stories from you from your NFL days, your college days, and we're gonna talk about the upcoming season. Um, I never want to be disrespectful and ask somebody to tell a story about somebody else because you have stories that are unbelievable and you got to be able to play at, a, at an amazingly high level. But you happen to play with – I'm the resident Cleveland Brown fan. I'm kind of the only okay. one around where we live. And You're, you're a loyal fan. Cleveland, yeah, Bass, believe Cleveland Brown fans are the most loyal fans in the world. So, uh, so you, you, you. Ha- you had the luxury of playing with – who and I don't mean to disrespect to you or anything, with, in my opinion, the greatest offensive lineman to ever play the game of football and one of my heroes in Joe Thomas. He's kind of a crazy guy. Do you have a crazy Joe Thomas story? If you don't, it's totally fine. If you do, <laughs> I would really like to hear well, it. Well, it, it, there's no disrespect when you mention Joe Thomas' thing. I mean, he, <laughs> he is one of the greatest players, uh, not only to put a Cleveland Browns jersey on, but just to put any – sports jersey on, basketball, football, baseball, whatever you name it. Uh, he's a guy who, he, you know the weather that we played in, in Cleveland and the guy still had to face this year. And he being from Wisconsin, he calls that God's country, and he loves it. <laughs> uh, the colder, the better. Uh, on his negative dec- decrees outside, he's the guy out there with his shirt off and just enjoying it as if he's walking on a beach in Florida. So. Uh, that will probably be the only flaw that Joe Thomas has <laughs> is, is loving the cold weather too much. But outside of that, uh, he's as solid as they come. He's as good as they come. And I hate that as it appears the Browns are about to turn the corner that he's uh, transitioned out to uh, a few other things. All right. Now, you were – I want to get back on you. You were drafted in the second round of the Browns. Uh, you came out of Georgia. Yeah. You played with the Browns from 2009 to 2012. Now, back in 2009 – the Browns maybe didn't feel as hopeless as they have the last few years. What was your first thought when you got the call from them? Like, at first, were you at the draft or did you watch it at home with the family? And then when it was the Browns calling, what did you think? Uh, well, I watched it at home with the, fam- with the family, and I'm originally from Charlotte, um, and I'm a Southern guy, and we don't really get much coverage on, on the Browns. 
and you know, forgive me for this, but North Carolina is a big basketball state, so oh, yeah. most of our focus goes on Charlotte Hornet. But and look, we're in Patrick Memphis. Came to town. Like Memphis is hoop city, so like we we understand that. Ah, uh, don't 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 do that. Don't do that. Shit. <laughs> North, North North Carolina. <laughs> Let's keep it on North Carolina. Uh, but uh, I, I will say that that my knowledge of the Browns was was um vague at best. So I, I actually went in with a with a clean slate, not not really knowing much and starting to educate myself when I when I got there. And it is one of those places that is very rich in culture, as you know, um uh, winning tradition. It hasn't been like that in the last few years. But very, very prideful group. And I always tell people I, I know when LeBron came back it was a big deal, but if the Browns are able to make a serious run or, you know, win a national not a national but a Super Bowl then I I don't know what they'll do to that place. Uh, they'll, they'll just be overjoyed. I hope the city is still standing afterwards. Oh, I could only imagine. I'll, I'll be there if that ever happens. There's no <laughs> no doubt in my mind. So I, I think you and every Browns fan from around the world will, will be in Cleveland. P- Pilgrimage that back. That's right. So I want to ask you about some of your coaches that you played for. You played in college under Mark Rick, unbelievable college mm-hmm. coach. Everybody in the country knows him. And in the pros, mm-hmm. you played under Eric Mangini and then – a guy who just got his second head coaching job in Pat Shermer this year. Uh, what mm-hmm. do those guys have in common that made them, you know, be, I guess, able to get jobs at that kind of level? And then how are they just all different? Well, first, I mean, obviously, to, to get, get a job at that level, no one does it by luck. So you, you're dealing with everyone that um, high football IQ, um, guys that, that – they understand what it what it takes to win. They had success from the places that they were coming from. I'll, I'll start with Coach Rick, who um, is different than, than most coaches, obviously. He leads with his uh, faith background, and he's able to get a lot of just great players that, that way. And um, he's an offensive-minded guy. He, he learned of the, uh, Bobby Bowden down in Florida State. And um, we learned a lot of things. We were able to have a lot of success. And now he's a guy who has um, – I think it's just rejuvenated going back home and being in the Miami Hurricanes atmosphere all over again. I'm, I'm hoping that he's able to get a national championship down there, not before Georgia, um, <laughs> but I do hope he gets one um, soon, sooner rather than later. And then you have uh, Mangini, who's probably closer to, I would say, your, your Bill Belichick. And with with him, defensive-minded guy, hard, hard-nosed guy. No nonsense. Um, and and if you remember, he, he had some success at um, his the stop before us, and it's it's one of those things that in in the NFL, likewise with with Pat Shermer, who's um, you see he had success with the Minnesota Vikings last last year, and now he's going to New York. Uh, sometimes in your second stop, uh, speaking about Pat Shermer, now you you, you know you, you learn more, you, you've been under the fire, you understand how to manage a team, you understand how to manage players, you understand situational football better. Um, you just have more experience. So I, I'm thinking that uh, Pat Shermer's uh, second go-around will be a lot different than his go-around with the Browns. And I think Mangini was a case that had he had a little bit more time with the Browns, potentially um, things would have turned out a little bit different. I, I think that when Holmgren and his staff came, you start to see a softer side of Mangini inside to start to uh, relate to the players a little bit better. So you just never know um, with some of these things. Uh, with Coach Rick, had had the Alabama game gone a little bit different um, on the five yard line, maybe he's the, the the guy that brings the national championship to Georgia. But that's not the case. Um, maybe with Mangini, if a couple things go differently now that Shermer's in the Big Apple, maybe things go different with uh, Saquon Barkley and Odell Beckham Jr. You you just never know with coaching. And there's a lot of good coaches where their record doesn't always show. But um, Coach Rick and Shermer, they're, they're having second chances. So we'll, we'll see what happens uh, with it. Not, I'm not sure what Manji is doing now. Probably, uh, I, I think he's doing TV, show. I think. I'm not real sure about that. Oh, he's on, <laughs> the, the irony, he, he never liked talking to the media. Now he's, uh, but he becomes the media. The yeah. That's right. <laughs> well, when you got a brain like that, sometimes that's just what you got to do. Now, tell me you this. you got to share that knowledge. Uh, aside from the head coaches, it, how much of your play is is based on? At, well, maybe I'm asking this wrong. I, I want to know what the role of like the position coach and coordinator is, as opposed to the head coach. Which one has more of an effect on you as far as your play goes? 
Um, I would say think of the head coach as probably the CEO that they're dealing with a lot more outside of just the X's and O's. They're they're basically dealing with the whole organization top down and, and making sure that, that things are run smoothly across whether it's the training room, uh, the weight room, players, contracts, all that good stuff. And then your uh, coordinators are strictly focused on, okay, how does this offense or defense work together and it's up to the position coach to make sure that uh, at the granular level that the players know exactly what they're doing and to prepare for them. So uh, with the head coach, uh, the, the players obviously have great relationships with it, but we're more so focused on the coordinator and our position coach. And if you have a, a coach, let's say like um, Coach Rick, you know, he's going to be more hands-on with the offense. If you have a guy like Mike Dini, he's probably going to be a little more hands-on with the defense, making sure that that's polished up because that's their, that's their sweet spot. But especially for young talent, the position coaches are crucial just because whether you're coming into the SEC or you're coming into the NFL, there's so much that you have to learn to get acclimated to the game. And if you don't have exceptional vets on the team, sometimes that transition can be a little tricky. So it's up for them to catch you up to speed. Uh, and sometimes it's for them to find the right guys to make sure that they can do what they're trying to teach them. So they're kind of playing both sides. Okay. All right. I, I want to have a little fun with you. And I'm going to get Chris to ask Let's this go. question. Yep. You were with the Browns for four years. So from 09 to 2012, mm-hmm. you had seven starting quarterbacks. Now we've got a list. Yeah. Can you name all seven of them? <laughs> I, I can. Uh, Brady <laughs> Quinn, who I actually saw about two weeks ago. Okay. Uh, Derek Anderson, who is, is still a good friend of mine as well. Jake DeLone, he came from the Panthers. So I, I was a big fan of him. I'm from Charlotte. Then you have Seneca Wallace, who's doing really well in arena football right now. Uh, Colt McCoy. Uh, you have uh, Brandon Whedon. Uh, I'm trying to see. Was Thad Lewis in that? That's Thad Lewis's um, last one. <laughs> Man, you yeah, knocked that, that out like nothing. Thad <laughs> Lewis. Um, and then you, you can even get uh, Josh Cribbs in there with his, with his Wildcat. That's stuff. right. I, uh, that, that is absolutely <laughs> right. You, the Wildcat yeah, Cribbs. That's, uh, did he ever throw you uh, any passes from the Wildcat? Uh, he was supposed to, but he always took off the ramp, <laughs> He just so. took the he just took the ball and said, "I'm not giving this up. This is mine." Yeah, and, and so in great. practice, uh, he would throw him, and then in the games, he turned into uh, a, a returner. I think he just forget and think that we're supposed to be blocking for him. Uh, but uh, ideally, you wouldn't play with that many quarterbacks. But the, the benefit is that you make a lot of friends. So uh, I, I can't believe you named them that quick. <laughs> you didn't even have to think about it. Man, yeah, it's like well, you had a list in front of you or something. That's kind of the, that's kind of been the <laughs> Cleveland thing is uh, is just running through. Well, uh, ho- hopefully that that I've seen the jersey uh, that has like fifty names on it. That's and right. Hopefully they can put it in, into that with Tyrod or. Uh, Baker Mayfield. Hey, I'm a huge Tyrod fan this year. We'll we, that. Yeah, we're going to get to that here in a minute. I'm going to ask you one more question about being recruited because we talk, we cover a lot of college football recruiting and stuff. What all schools were recruiting you out of high school? What were your list and and what made you pick Georgia? Um, wow. Well, that re- recruiting actually turns into a, a headache for some guys because you have so many coaches reaching out to you, and it's a huge blessing. But when you're 16, 17, 18, you really don't know what all of it means, especially in the area that I grew up in. This was before social media and the Internet and everything. So it was all very, very new. I was the first person in my family to even go to college, let alone get a get a scholarship. So yeah. I, I think that um, for, for me, I had the opportunity to really go anywhere that I wanted. And every week I would literally change my mind just because you see the next shiny thing. North Carolina does something, you're going to North Carolina. Tennessee does something, you're going to Tennessee. Uh, USC is winning games. You're like, oh, I should take a visit out there. I haven't been, but I think I'm going to commit whenever I go. And it got so overwhelming that my mom was literally like, okay, you figure it out. And whenever you're ready to make a true decision, I sign on the line and wrap me in. But uh, my <laughs> high school quarterback. Uh, so so wait, wait, Cox, your mom was not uh, was not yeah. super involved in it? No, she was super involved in it, but a lot of times parents would let the, the kids make the decision because ultimately you're the one that has to yeah. play there, you have to do things. But I think that she knew that 
next week it would change. So just to let me get all the, the <laughs> nonsense out the way, and whenever I was ready to make a, an adult decision to, to bring her back into the loop. Okay. Uh, okay. But she went everywhere. She was on most of the calls. She knew everything that was going on. But it's literally like, oh, if you go somewhere, you're like, oh, I want one of those, I want one of those. And they're like, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> um, so that, that's kind of what, what happened until probably entered into my senior year when I, I started to make more sense of the whole thing. And I actually ended up committing early. And it, it worked out really well. And Joe Cox, my high school quarterback, we were, um, you know, just going through summer workouts. And he was like, hey, I want to go for a um, camp down in Georgia where you go with me. And I was like, sure. Georgia had offered me at the time, but I didn't know much about it. Uh, I hadn't taken a visit there yet, and we went. He got a scholarship offer. He committed the next day, and he actually became the guy that started to recruit me. And at the time, I want to say Tennessee was real heavy up on the list, and I'm glad I didn't commit there. <laughs> but uh, he, he he became the, the, the guy that, 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 that made Georgia very real to me, and when I looked, it made complete sense with Fred Gibson and – Reggie Brown leaving and, you know, the success that they had had up until that point. So it, it was a good decision um, in the long run. Well, Athens is a beautiful place. I've never been to a game there, but I've been on campus. Man, that place is gorgeous. You should. You should add that to your bucket list. It's, uh, it's on the one list. One of the best sports yeah, experiences. It's, it's definitely on the list. Let's, let's talk about Georgia a little bit. I, I've got one main thing because I, I went through, I was looking at stats and whatnot. And, look, you're, uh, you're season high in receptions every season that you played was against Georgia Tech. Now, what was the reason you were used more against the Yellow Jackets? Is that, tell me, is that a real rivalry, or is it just kind of one-sided? Like, does Georgia Tech hate Georgia more, and Georgia hates Florida or whoever? Or or is it like, nah. is it real deal? I, I think the, the, the thing that's, that's tough is because there's true hatred in uh, among so many teams like, Georgia legitimately hates Florida. Georgia legitimately hates Auburn. Georgia legitimately hates um, every team in the SEC. <laughs> and when it comes to Georgia Tech, because we share the same state, uh, we just don't want to lose to those guys. People have family members. They have, yeah. Did we lose him? Oh, man, he was getting good. Yeah, he was getting Everybody good. Getting where, where are we at? Muhammad, you still around? You put us on mute. All right, so uh, so we'll pick up where you left off. Um, you were talking right. about how much uh, you know Georgia fans hate basically everybody, and in that state, Georgia Tech and Georgia fans are you know they're in each other's family. They don't want to lose to each other. Um, and so uh, tell me tell me about you and and how you ended up with that many receptions every time you played them. Like it was your season high literally every year. It, you know what I think it is, is it's my birthday. My birthday is November 24th, and it always falls around <laughs> Thanksgiving weekend. And I, I want to say it's just a, a good birthday gift from so, so Coach uh, Rick, Mike Bobo and yeah, Matt they hooked Stafford. You up. So that, that's probably like the only thing I could attribute it to. <laughs> oh, I like that. I like that. And that's a good birthday time. I'm a 22nd birthday for it's November. A, so. It's a good birthday. Yeah. 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 Right yeah. around Thanksgiving. No, You're always no around better family. way to give it birthday gift other than give a receiver a hope we should pass it so yeah there you go all right let, let's talk about 2018 college football uh it is okay. there a surprise team that could pop up in the sec this season or even in coming years or is this just going to be alabama georgia's conference for years and years to come well georgia did it last year i don't think anyone expected us to arrive to the party as fast as we did no. uh, without a vip pass at that you know uh so i I wouldn't put it past South Carolina. I wouldn't put it past Florida, uh, LSU, Tennessee. These guys are recruiting the same athletes and the same type of players that we are. Even when the record is bad, the, the players are still good. It's just some things that aren't clicking for the team as a unit. So we can't go into any game this year, whether it's Vanderbilt or Kentucky or some of the other teams that, that don't appear to be uh, powerhouses. But in saying that, I fully expect us to to have a rematch with that Alabama again. I I think I agree. I'll tell you this: we put out our SEC East previews uh, a couple of weeks ago, and mm -hmm. I picked Georgia to go eleven and one, but I picked them to lose to South Carolina. Chris over here had them nine and three. I don't even know what he was thinking. But I, it, look, on, yeah. I, don't, don't I don't tell him that. Don't tell him that. Chris, I don't. 
Yeah. Don't tell him that. Look, 11-1 and one, I thought was pretty reasonable. Right? So last year, Georgia goes into Auburn. It was the, the only real hostile environment that Georgia played in. And this year, the only real hostile environment, it, it, unless you want to count Kentucky or whatever, but a hostile environment that, that they could lose, I thought they might get caught by South Carolina in week two. Am I crazy for thinking that? Because Georgia fans have been all over me telling me we're not losing to South Carolina. You know, I don't care what week it is. We got more players than they do, et cetera. Is 11-1 and one not realistic? I think it's realistic. I think that especially when you look at South Carolina, they've been considered probably the fourth team in the East for a long time, always behind that uh, revolving door that's Tennessee, Florida, Georgia. So I think this is their time to figure out, you know, can they – uh, emerge as one of the SEC leaders now that the uncertainty with Florida and Tennessee is up for grabs and the timing of which they're playing Georgia when we're trying to figure it out, losing all the talent that we had last year. So I, I think it's a, a a chance, anything's a chance, but I, I want to say that one of the best things that probably happened for our program is the way that Auburn game happened the first time we played them just because it was one of those things where we're riding high and we got knocked off our horse. And Kirby can always use it as a reference. And a lot of the guys that are currently there understand what it feels like to go into a place and, and basically, you know, get beat up. Uh, but the thing that did happen, the way that we rebounded that same team in the SEC championship, I think that's the type of performance that you can expect whenever we start to go in those hostile environments uh, and put our best foot forward. All right. Now, I, I want to get just a, a quick preview of the SEC from you. I'm going to read off a few Vegas win totals, rapid-fire style. Okay. I just want you to tell me over-under, all right? Okay. All right. LSU, they're over-under is seven. They're going over-under. Over. All right. Auburn, they've got it nine. Even. Even? Okay. Uh, They've got Florida at eight and a half. Over. Ooh, all right, Ooh, all right. Okay. You like Dan Mullen then? I th- <laughs> I, no, I mean, I mean to to go eight and four is it, not a uh, how Florida would want their season to go. I think they can win eight games though. Okay, or okay. nine, you know, yeah, one or the other. Either, either way, you think it'll be around eight and four, nine and three. Uh, Texas A yeah. and M, they've got it seven. So, what, what do you think about Jimbo Fisher? You think he gets that turned around? No, I think he's right, right around. He has, he has a lot that he has to overcome over there. Okay, okay. And then they've got South Carolina at seven. This will be the last one. South Carolina at seven. Over. Over. I like that. I like that. All right, let's let's uh, let's close up with some NFL talk. Uh, how many games do the Browns win this year? Nine. At least nine. I love it. Nine this, wins? This, this is it right here. All right, now, now is this because of Tyrod Taylor or is this because of Baker Mayfield? I think it's because of Tyrod Taylor. Uh, I'll answer it like this. If Baker Mayfield wins the job, he's extremely special because Tyrod is a solid quarterback, and we saw what he did for Buffalo last year. He is a but professional quarterback. Career, yeah. He's a special quarterback, and Baker's going to learn a lot from him. And it's probably one of the first situations where you don't come into the season with a true quarterback controversy. I know the outside is saying, you know, can – Baker win the job, but it's not as if he's unseating a guy that is, you know, up for grabs. Tyrod's had tremendous success in the last few years. Well, I mean, he so got the Bills what to the Tyrod's playoffs. Gonna do, yeah. Excuse me? I said he got the Bills to the playoffs. That's a pretty big deal. <laughs> he, he got the Bills. It, that is a huge deal. So Ty, Tyrod, for me, he's going to be the guy that stabilizes the franchise and gives Baker a chance just to learn what it means to be an NFL quarterback. How do you prepare? How do you present yourself? just what this whole game is about. And I think he's going to help slow the game down for Baker. So whenever he takes the reins, which I anticipate probably next year, um, hopefully, you know, it's a smooth transition and it works out the best for both. Uh, but then you look at the, the pieces that receiver, I think Josh Gordon is going to come back and be the Josh Gordon that he was when he led the NFL and receive. Oh, yeah. And you know what you're getting out of Jarvis Landry. He's a pro bowl type player who, it's going to be a, a great safety valve, and it's going to spring one loose every once in a while. They have Coleman on the outside, an athletic tight end uh, who came from Coach Rick's squad down in Miami. Uh, and 
then you have the two-headed monster at running back, you have Chubb, who, you know, he, he can do, and Carlos Hyde, who's an Ohio State guy, uh, which should, should make the fans happy up there. And on, on defense, you know, I've seen clips of Denzel Ward. And he looks like he can uh, be a huge asset at the corner position, even though he's a rookie. I think he has a very high ceiling. He's going to make a lot of good plays. And they've done a great job of building the team, not just getting random pieces that they think may fit in, but actually addressing true needs and strategically putting this thing together. For that reason, I think that 9-7 and seven is realistic. Uh, I, I don't think that you know they're going to be the big bully of the, of the division, but I do think that they're going to be highly, highly competitive this year, especially when Never Josh Gordon walks back into the building and they all gel together. That's I, I wish you could see Chris's face right now. I mean, he's nodding to everything you were saying. I'm glowing right now, man. <laughs> and, and, and I know that I'm the homer because I've been saying this, but but I really, truly believe it. Jarvis Landry came out and told everybody, we're going to score 40 a game. Look at this offense. Uh, I, I like moving Joe uh, Benina to, to the left tackle to take um, uh, Joe Thomas's place. And, and that guy was a wrecking ball at guard last year. I think he can do it. Um, so I like the line. I, I I like everything about this team, and and I do think they can be the bullies. That conference, that division, doesn't scare me at all. They've been the bastard child for too long. They will not anymore. Tyrod Taylor is a <laughs> professional quarterback. I've been trying to tell people that. And also, if they he wins yeah, nine dude. games, Baker won't start next year. They'll build a statue to Tyrod. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, uh, Derek Anderson won, won, won 10 games. That's and right. They, yeah. they ended up somewhat dismantling that team. So I, I don't think that they'll do that this time around. I, I do think that they'll just continue to ride the momentum, whatever that is. Uh, I'm, in, I'm anticipating this. It's nine games. And once you stabilize the franchise, then you can start to get other guys to come in. Then you can start to get the buy-in. You're not going into the season as the stepchild. You're going into the season actually playing for something. And who who knows? We, we don't know what the Bengals are going to be. We don't know what the Ravens are going to be. They're they're calling for uh, Lamar Jackson to beat out Joe Flacco, and then RG three. He's from one small sample size. You know, he looked like he could potentially um, have found his way again. And their defense isn't you know the regulars Ed Reed. You, you just never know. So I, I'm hoping that. Uh, like you're not hoping South Carolina sneaks up on Georgia. I hope that the Browns are able to sneak up on a lot of people early and just carry that momentum out throughout the rest of the season. All right, now we have kept you forever, so we uh, we do appreciate you hopping on. We're going to have to get you back on later on this season. That sound all right? Uh, for sure, for sure. Good luck to you guys, and uh, we'll see how all this plays out. Absolutely. Good he luck is to everything you're doing too, man. Former Thank Georgia you. and Cleveland Browns wide receiver Muhammad Masakwai. You can follow him on Twitter at Iron Masakwai. All right, buddy. We'll talk to you soon, all right? All right, you guys. Take it easy. All right, take care. Yeah. God, that was awesome.